Hi everyone, this is Kalyan Kumar and welcome to Chemistry Tutorials. It's been a little while since I made my last video on uh, De Broglie's matter waves, that was part 10. And that was because I run another channel called Product Review where I review various types of products including gadgets and softwares. So in case you haven't checked it out, please go ahead and check out the other channel that I run. And uh, so I was making some videos for that particular channel and so this took a little bit of backseat. But now we are back with Atomic Structure Part 11 of 13 part series. And today we are going to talk about Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle. And uh, this particular video reminds me of a very famous quote uh, by one of the greatest physicists of all times, Richard Feynman. When he was uh, starting a course on quantum mechanics to his students, he began by asking his students, uh, that if somebody were to give them a choice and somebody were to say that, okay, you have good news and bad news, uh, which one would they like to hear first? And uh, the students thought for a while and they said, okay, we would like to get the bad news out of the way first. And then he said, well, I have the same thing for you. I have a good news and a bad news. And since you prefer the bad news first, let me start with the bad news. And the bad news is you are not going to understand quantum mechanics. You're not going to intuitively imagine quantum mechanics the same way as you did with the Newtonian classical mechanics. You won't be able to see things, you won't be able to imagine how they move, how they behave, because quantum mechanics is purely mathematical. The only thing that can make sense to you is mathematical equations and not intuitive imagination. After a while, the students were quite curious to know what was the good news then? And then he said the good news is no one understands quantum mechanics. So you're not alone. And you're going to be as good and as bad at quantum mechanics at the end of this course as I am today. So let me also begin by giving you this uh, piece of news that we are stepping into the realms of quantum mechanics. We caught a bit of a glimpse of quantum mechanics when we started with Bohr's atomic model where we got that MVR is NH by 2 pi. That's where the quantum mechanics really started. Then we went into the Planck's uh, equation which again used a quantization principle for energy and now we are going deeper and deeper and in the last episode we talked about the uh, De Broglie's matter waves which said that even matter has wave nature. It was really, really hard to digest that till Davidson and Germer proved that he was right by experiment. And now we are going deeper into it and we are now talking about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Now let me before we begin this video let me give you an idea as to what you should not be doing, do not try to imagine stuff in the classical way. Because the only way we understand things in an intuitive way is by imagining it. And the only imagination that we have is the classical world, the classical mechanics, the Newtonian kind of fixed and clockwise mechanics that we are used to. Please do not use this video or try to go into quantum mechanics keeping the Heisenbergs, keeping the sorry classical mechanics in your mind. So this is going to be a little different. So please do not try to imagine anything here. And uh, even though I'm going to try my best to give you some experimental videos, I'm going to demonstrate some uh, idea about how uh, one can to an extent understand this in a little intuitive way. But remember, it's all mathematical. And though we are not going to deal with that level of mathematics in this particular video, but the idea is not to spend time too much in imagining stuff. So let's start with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. In fact, I prefer to call it the Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle rather than the idea of uncertainty. And you'll catch up soon as to why I uh, would like to rename it. In 1927, a German uh, assistant of Niel Bohr working in Niel Bohr's uh, Institute of Physics at, at uh, Copenhagen, Werner Heisenberg, introduced a theoretical argument for subatomic particles now known as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Now the uncertainty principle is any of a variety of mathematical inequalities asserting a fundamental limit to the precision with which certain pairs of physical properties of a particle or a matter particle, matter wave particle such as position x and momentum p can be known simultaneously. So what this principle basically tells you is that there are certain limits beyond which you cannot be precise 
about a pair of physical properties such as position and momentum. The more precisely the position of some particle is determined, the less precisely its momentum can be known and vice versa. A more formal inequality relating the deviation in position delta x and the deviation in momentum delta p was derived by Earl Hezek Canard later that year and independently by Hermann Weyl in 1928. And uh, both of them were Germans. So Germans were really good at physics at the time. And in fact, they're even now. And the inequality suggested was delta x into delta p is greater than or equal to h bar by 2 or h over 4 pi. h bar or h cross is basically h by 2 pi, which is very often used. And uh, you can either call it h bar by 2 or h over 4 pi. Now, the uncertainty principle is one of the most famous and probably the most misunderstood ideas in physics. Most of the explanations that are given for uncertainty principle are incorrect. It tells us that there is fuzziness in, the, in, in nature. This basic principle is about fuzziness in nature. There's no clarity there. A fundamental limit to what we can know about the behavior of quantum particles and therefore the smallest scales of nature. Of these scales, the most we can hope for is to calculate probabilities for where things are and how they will behave. So we are talking about probabilities and not we not being deterministic about stuff. Unlike Isaac Newton's clockwork universe, where everything follows clear-cut laws on how to move and prediction is easy if you know the starting conditions, the uncertainty principle enshrines a level of fuzziness into quantum theory. The uncertainty principle is an extrapolation of the wave particle duality proposed by de Broglie. One of the most frequent but incorrect explanations, because see, we need to understand how incorrect people are when they explain certain things. One of the most frequent and incorrect explanations offered is the one involving the observer effect. And this is one of the most uh, classical examples of trying to explain quantum mechanics through the eyes of a classical mechanics person. It's like trying to observe a color red by wearing glasses which are blue. It doesn't work that way. In this explanation, which is a wrong explanation, it is imagined that there is a blind person in a room who's trying to locate a ball whose velocity is known. Let's imagine that there's a pendulum and there's a huge ball attached at the end of the rope and the pendulum is swinging in a room and there's a blind person in the room. At every moment of time, the blind person is told the direction of movement of the uh, ball of the pendulum, the, whether it is moving from left to right or right to left. And he's also told about the speed with which it is traveling. So he is able to know the momentum of the particle and he's able to know the velocity of the particle at any given point of time. But since it is swinging by and he's blind, he can't see it. So its location is unknown. Now the blind person knows the velocity of the ball, but does not know its location since he cannot see it. Now, in order to know where the ball is, he's constantly punching the air with his fists and kicking the air with his feet in order to touch the ball to know its location. So that is the only way he'll be able to know. Now, as long as he's not able to touch the ball, he cannot know its location, but he it is but he's being told or perhaps by some mechanism, he knows the velocity of the ball in terms of the speed as well as the direction of movement left to right or right to left. Now, in case he is able to touch the ball with his fists or feet, he knows the location of the ball at that moment. But in touching it, he ends up changing its velocity. So when he knows the location, the velocity becomes unknown. Now, Heisenberg used a similar thought experiment to explain the uncertainty principle, which involved at an electron through uh, looking at an electron through a microscope by shooting photons of gamma rays. Now, seeing a subatomic particle such as electron is not simple. You might bounce a photon off it and then hope to detect the photon with an instrument, 
but chances are that the photon will import some momentum to the electron as it hits it and changes the path of the particle you are trying to measure. Or else, given that quantum particles often move so fast, the electron may no longer be in the place it was when the photon originally bounced off it. Either way, your observation of either position or momentum will be inaccurate and more importantly, the act of observation affects the particle being observed. Now, I want you to understand this, that it, it might sound logical to you. It might sound quite intuitive to you. To, I mean, it, it's perfectly fine. The, when the moment the blind person touches the ball, he's not able to do it, blah, blah, blah. But what happens if, the, if, if, if it's not a blind person? If it's a person with vision, he's being told the velocity, he knows the velocity at every moment in time, speed as well as direction, and can also see the ball. So one might feel that the reason this guy could not do both was because he's blind. And had he not been blind, he would be able to observe both. That is not the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle is not because of uh, our ability to measure both. It is not the lack of technology which it is talking about. It is the fact that it is an inherent property of nature. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a video. It's called the, the you know, Dr. Quantum. And this video will tell you how the observer can affect the behavior of an electron. And this video will tell you how an electron behaves both like a particle and a wave. So giving you the De Broglie's uh, vision and how the De Broglie's equation was proved to be right, as well as the fact that, you know, uh, how the observer affects a particular experimental outcome and how this is not the correct explanation for the Heisenberg's ancillary principle. So here is the video. And here we are the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles or little balls of matter act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It 
doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. Physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. It was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. Now that we have seen it, the aforementioned explanation is not valid as it has since become clear, however, that the uncertainty principle is inherent in the properties of all wave-like systems and that it arises in quantum mechanics simply due to the matter of uh, the, the wave nature of all quantum objects. Thus, the uncertainty principle actually states a fundamental property of quantum systems and is not a statement observed about the observational success of current technology. The explanation stated above already assumes the observed particle or observed thing to be a particle, whereas the uncertainty principle is an extension or a consequence of wave particle duality. In fact, the reason the above example is used to understand this principle is primarily because of the wrong terminology used in the very paper that uh, Heisenberg published. The principle should be actually indeterminacy and not uncertainty. Now, throughout the main body of his original paper in 1927, written in German, Heisenberg used the word Umbustamite to talk about indeterminacy to describe the basic theoretical principle. Only in the end, end note did he switch the word to Ernst which means uncertainty. When the English language version of Heisenberg's textbook on the perceptual content of quantum theoretical kinematics and mechanics was published in 1930. However, the translation uncertainty was used everywhere and it became the more commonly used term in the English language thereafter. Now, according to De Broglie, all matter in the universe is composed of matter waves. Then the only way we can explain particles which are localized unlike waves, is if we assume that all particles are the manifestations of the superposition of several waves. Please try and understand this. According to De Broglie, all matter in the universe is composed of matter waves. Now, if you want to explain a particle which is localized, unlike a wave which is delocalized, then the only way you can explain a particle's localized nature is by trying to say that that particle is the superposition of several waves. If several waves are superimposed to give rise to a resultant wave, 
the resultant wave would be more localized or spread over a lesser region. I'll just show you that. Now consider a sine wave as shown here. If we were uh, to wonder where the wave is, well, it is spread over the entire space from minus infinity to plus infinity. If the electron behaves as a simple sine wave, then its position is uncertain over a large span of space. So if the electron were to behave like a wave, as in those experiments where its wave nature is exposed, then its position cannot be known because it will go from minus infinity to plus infinity because it's behaving like a wave. Since the electron wave has a well-defined wavelength, however, then by De Broglie's equation, it should also have a well-defined momentum. So if an electron behaves like a wave, then its position will have a high indeterminacy, but its momentum will have an existence of a very precise value. So try and understand this. If the electron were a single wave, then we know that a single wave has a well-defined wavelength. And by De Broglie's equation, one can calculate the exact momentum. So the indeterminacy in momentum is very low, whereas the indeterminacy in the position is very high because a wave goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. For example, if I were, if, if you are listening to this using a speaker, then the, room, the, the sound of my voice is filling the entire room. If I were to ask you, where is my sound? Would you point to the speaker? If the sound is in the speaker, then why are you able to hear it? It's there in the eardrum as well. In fact, it's behind you as well. The sound is spread over a large area, large volume. And therefore, if we were to say, is the position of the wave uncertain because of our inability or the fact that we don't have a superior technology to measure it? No, there isn't a position to measure. The indeterminacy in position is inherent in the very fact that it's a wave. A wave cannot have a localized position. Now let us assume that the electron behaves like a particle. By definition, a particle is highly localized. Now this can only happen if we assume the particle is like a wave pulse or a wave which is restricted in space or a wave packet. This can be achieved by super imposing several waves of different wavelengths in phase. So just imagine this particular wave. It's got very short wavelength. Let's imagine this wave. It has got a larger wavelength and will keep increasing the wavelength and keep superimposing them. And you just notice in this part, in the middle part, the crests are all meeting together. That, that's the meaning of in phase. That at least in some place, all the crests would meet. Okay. So if you were to assume an electron like a particle, then you would assume it is a superposition of so many waves. And notice that in every wave at this place, you have a crest. But can you see they have different wavelengths? The result of all of this would give you a wave packet like this. This is called a wave packet or a wave pulse. So let me show you that in the form of a small clip. So wave one is already there, two is superimposing on it. Look at the fact, the crests are meeting, so the wave packet keeps rising at that point. Keeps going up, more and more waves come and meet it there and the wave packet keeps becoming uh, more and more localized in nature. And uh, you, if, you, if you notice here, the wavelengths cannot be easily determined because there are going to be different, different wavelengths. Because not everywhere the crests and the troughs are meeting exactly in phase because of different wavelength. But look at the spike. The spike is going up and up. So what is basically happening is that the localization of electron is taking place. You can actually say that it is in this region of space that the electron is located. So if infinite waves superimpose this way, we end up getting one peak and everywhere else, it will be completely flat. It goes like this. Everything else is flat. And one place you have a spike. And again, everything is flat. This is what happens if you superimpose infinite waves in phase. And this spike is the region where the electron can be found. So we are able to localize the electron now. They can say, okay, it's not everywhere. It's not here. It's not here. It's only in this region of space. There's a very small amount of inaccuracy involved in measuring the 
place where the electron is present. Now the wave has been localized to a large extent. This is the particle manifestation of the matter waves. But it is not possible to assign any value for the wavelength as it is indeterminate. This is because it is made up of infinite waves of different wavelength and the wave pulse obtained by the addition of some waves has no fixed wavelength. Moreover, on addition of infinite waves, we get a single pulse. Since it has only one crest and no other crest available, its wavelength is indeterminate. It's not that we cannot determine it. There isn't one. Therefore, the momentum is also as indeterminate as wavelength because they are related by the de Broglie's equation. Now, the reason we do not observe this kind of situation for macro particles is because when we say h over 4 pi, h is so small that you will not be able to measure this kind of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for macro objects. Because of this, the indeterminacy of position and momentum of a macro particle is so small so as to be unnoticeable. While the same for a subatomic particle like an electron is significant enough to make a difference. And now I'm going to show you another video where we are going to talk about the same stuff as I said now, uh, but with some kind of an animation that will probably make it uh, clear to you. Feel free to stop the video at any point of time, go behind, go back, have a look and take your time in understanding everything that is being said. Because remember videos are continuous, you can stop, pause them at any time, think about what is being said, write down what is being said and then you'll be able to understand everything. So here is the second video. The Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle is one of a handful of ideas from quantum physics to expand into general pop culture. It says that you can never simultaneously know the exact position and the exact speed of an object, and shows up as a metaphor in everything from literary criticism to sports commentary. Uncertainty is often explained as a result of measurement, that the act of measuring an object's position changes its speed, or vice versa. The real origin is much deeper and more amazing. The uncertainty principle exists because everything in the universe behaves like both a particle and a wave at the same time. In quantum mechanics, the exact position and exact speed of an object have no meaning. To understand this, we need to think about what it means to behave like a particle or a wave. Particles, by definition, exist in a single place at any instant in time. We can represent this by a graph showing the probability of finding the object at a particular place, which looks like a spike, 100% at one specific position, and zero everywhere else. Waves, on the other hand, are disturbances spread out in space, like ripples covering the surface of a pond. We can clearly identify features of the wave pattern as a whole, most importantly its wavelength, which is the distance between two neighboring peaks, or two neighboring valleys but we can't assign it a single position. It has a good probability of being in lots of different places. Wavelength is essential for quantum physics because an object's wavelength is related to its momentum, mass times velocity. A fast-moving object has lots of momentum, which corresponds to a very short wavelength. A heavy object has lots of momentum even if it's not moving very fast, which again means a very short wavelength. This is why we don't notice the wave nature of everyday objects. If you toss a baseball up in the air, its wavelength is a billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a meter, far too tiny to ever detect. Small things, like atoms or electrons, though, can have wavelengths big enough to measure in physics experiments. So if we have a pure wave, we can measure its wavelength and thus its momentum, but it has no position. We can know a particle's position very well, but it doesn't have a wavelength so we don't know its momentum. To get a particle with both position and momentum, we need to mix the two pictures to make a graph that has waves, but only in a small area. How can we do this? By combining waves with different wavelengths, which means giving our quantum object some possibility of having different momenta. When we add two waves, we find that there are places where the peaks line up, making a bigger wave, and other places where the peaks of one fill in the valleys of the other. The result has regions where we see waves separated by regions of nothing at all. If we add a third wave, the regions where the waves cancel out get bigger, a fourth and they get bigger still, 
with the wavy regions becoming narrower. If we keep adding waves, we can make a wave packet with a clear wavelength in one small region. That's a quantum object with both wave and particle nature. But to accomplish this, we had to lose certainty about both position and momentum. The position isn't restricted to a single point. There's a good probability of finding it within some range of the center of the wave packet. And we made the wave packet by adding lots of waves, which means there's some probability of finding it with a momentum corresponding to any one of those. Both position and momentum are now uncertain, and the uncertainties are connected. If you want to reduce the position uncertainty by making a smaller wave packet, you need to add more waves, which means a bigger momentum uncertainty. If you want to know the momentum better, you need a bigger wave packet, which means a bigger position uncertainty. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, first stated by German physicist Werner Heisenberg back in 1927. This uncertainty isn't a matter of measuring well or badly, but an inevitable result of combining particle and wave nature. The uncertainty principle isn't just a practical limit on measurement. It's a limit on what properties an object can have built into the fundamental structure of the universe itself. All right, now that, that we have seen the second video, now let us take the case of an electron trapped in a hydrogen atom. Let's think about it classically. If the electron is to remain bound to the positively charged nucleus of the atom, it must have quite a small momentum. Then it will remain in the circular orbit of Bohr's theory. If the momentum becomes too big, the electron will tear itself away from the nucleus and escape. The electrical attraction of the nucleus will not be sufficient to hold it. This situation is essentially the same as what happens when a very rapidly moving comet towards the sun. If the comet moves slowly enough, it will remain trapped in an elliptical orbit but if it moves fast enough, it can flee into space never to return again. Velocity of the electron in the Bose orbit of hydrogen atom is given by this value. 2.19 into 10 to the power 6 z over n square beta per second. The momentum p is m into v. And therefore, what is p? Mass into this velocity. So this is the maximum momentum the electron can have. 1.99 into 10 to the power minus 24 kilogram meter per second. This is the maximum momentum an electron can have. If it has more than this, then it will escape out of the atom. Now, what is the lowest value of the momentum possible? Of, of course, zero. Though we know it cannot be zero because velocity can't be zero, otherwise it will fall into the nucleus. But let us say the minimum value is very close to zero. So the uncertainty in the momentum of the electron in the first orbit is Delta P is 1.99 into 10 to the power minus 24. This is the maximum range and the minimum range we are assuming is very close to zero. So this is the Delta P range that we have for an electron. And using the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, we can say Delta P into Delta X is H over 4 pi. And here we calculate Delta X. It comes out to be 0.264 angstroms. And if we were to tweak the value of the constant H over 4 pi, now this value, remember, is the least indeterminacy as we have used maximum indeterminacy for momentum. For momentum, we have said maximum uncertainty or indeterminacy, which, which is more appropriate, which will give us the minimum indeterminacy of delta x. Remember, delta x can be greater than this value. And if we use the h over 4 pi as h over 2 pi, then we get the value of delta x to be 0.528 angstrom, which is actually equal to the Bohr's first orbit radius of a hydrogen atom and uh, so mvr is h by 2 pi if n is 1 it is h over 2 pi so mv is pr pr is h by 2 pi so delta p into delta r is greater than or equal to h over 2 pi so this is very similar to uh, the heisenberg's uncertainty principle so we used the maximum uncertainty for delta p and we got the minimum value of delta r with h over 4 pi remember delta r could be greater than that and in this case, uh, if you use h over 2 pi, we are able to get this value as 0.529. So instead of visualizing an electron orbiting the nucleus at a distance of 0.529 angstroms, in the classical sense, it would be more appropriate to visualize this as a cloud representing a probability density with its maxima at a distance of 0.529 angstroms. So it's probability that we are talking about. Therefore, the electron is spread over the whole atom. It is futile to look at a particular spot within the atom for the electron. 
This reflects what we already expected from the use of matter waves to represent an electron in a hydrogen atom. Bohr's troublesome classical orbits are replaced by waves spread over the space surrounding the nucleus. These waves are often pictured as diffuse clouds. The simplest of these clouds is pictured as given on the left side of the slide. So it is more appropriate to use the term indeterminacy rather than uncertainty. And let me now tell you why we talk about indeterminacy rather than uncertainty and why am I so much harping on this word. This is because uncertainty means that there exists a specific value for a quantity which either we are not aware of or we cannot measure because of the current technology. But the value exists. For example, if you want to know the price of the most expensive laptop in the world today, we may not know it. We can find it though. But initially we are uncertain about it. Suppose we want to know the age of the earth with an accuracy of a year. We may either never be able to measure it or we may be able to do so in the future with some new technology. But its value does exist. The earth was formed at some point in time and its age does exist. But it is only that we don't know it. While indeterminacy means that there does not exist any exact value for the to measure at all. It has nothing to do with either our knowledge of technology or the expertise that we have. For example, if you want to know the price of a particular painting that will be auctioned, that does not exist a price. The price will be decided only when the auctioning is over. Even if we were to factor in all the aspects that would influence the price of the painting in the auction, if we try to mathematically calculate it, we will still not be able to come up with a particular value. We can't even say that the painting will sell for less than the total money each person participating in the room possesses because remember people can always borrow money. So even if you know that you know the, uh, the person who is the richest has several billions of dollars and that's the maximum price he's willing to pay, no, he may even borrow money and, and pay for the painting. So the price of the painting has a lot of uncertainty because there isn't one, there isn't a price of the painting that exists. Now in a given set of economic conditions, one can be more accurate about the price of a new product to be launched based on what the components are worth, factoring in all the variables such as brand, etc. But for a painting, there does not exist any value attached to it. It could have different value to different people. Similarly, unlike a physics experiment, one cannot predict the outcome of a roll of a dice because there is no single outcome of the throw of a dice. It is dealt using probability, not certainty. Quantum mechanics says that the electron's location and momentum are probabilistic and not deterministic. That does not exist any value to be found. When the position of a particle is indeterminate, that means there is no single position associated with the particle. Its wave is spread over many positions. It is not that the particle really has a definite position and we just don't know which it is. It is not that we are uncertain about the position because there are more facts to be known and only then we will be able to calculate the position. In fact, there are no further facts to know. So talk of uncertainty in Heisenberg's formula can be highly misleading. It suggests that we are just ignorant of something that could be known. It is easy to overlook the second way that we can come to be uncertain. The issue is indefinite and there is nothing more to know to know something. We already know everything and the only problem is that there is nothing to be found out. So now I'm going to present to you an experimental view of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. In this video, you will notice how photons show the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Now this experiment in a classical sense can be understood using the property of diffraction and from the quantum sense can be understood using the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So here is the third video. Today I'm doing an experiment that demonstrates Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So here I have a green laser and I'm firing it down towards the front of the room through a narrow slit. Now that slit can be adjusted so it could be made narrower or wider. And the laser spot is projected onto a screen behind it. So what do you think is going to happen to this spot on the screen as I narrow the slit? Well, let's have a look. Well, you see exactly what you'd expect. 
The spot gets narrower and narrower. The sides are getting cut off by the slit. Makes complete sense. And if you stop there, you would never realize that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is at work. But if you keep going, something strange happens. As you make the slit even narrower, the spot starts to spread out. Isn't that incredible? You're making the slit narrower, and yet the spot on the wall is getting wider. The narrower you make it, the wider that spot on the wall becomes. To understand this, we have to look at Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is normally written as delta x delta p is greater than or equal to h on 4 pi. So what does this mean? Well, it's about the position and the momentum of a particle. So x is the position of the particle and p is its momentum. So delta x is the uncertainty in position and delta p is the uncertainty in the momentum. Now, if you multiply those two quantities together, they must always be greater than or equal to h on 4 pi. Now, h is Planck's constant, and that deserves a video all to itself, like this one by 60 symbols. But for our purposes, it's just a very small number. So in our everyday lives, we don't come up against this uncertainty relation because everything is much, much bigger than h. But as we narrowed the slit, we were decreasing delta x for those photons. So we were getting more and more precise about where the photons were passing through that slit. And at a certain point, you come to this limit so that if you narrow this any further, you're going to break this uncertainty relationship. So what needs to happen is the uncertainty and momentum needs to go up. I should specify this is uncertainty and momentum in the x direction, in the horizontal direction. So if before photons were going perfectly straight, now they must veer off to the left or to the right to ensure that we don't break Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. And the more you decrease your uncertainty in position, the more narrow you make that slit, the more the uncertainty in momentum has to go up. And so if these photons are going to the left and the right, that's going to produce a much wider beam. It's really, really non-intuitive, but it's the way the world works. So now that you have seen the final video clip that I wanted to include in this presentation, uh, it's time uh, to end this video. So that was Atomic Structure Part 11 of 13, Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle. In the next part, which is going to be again a very big part and a very, very important and a most complicated one, that is called the Schrodinger's wave equation. So we're going to talk about that in the next video. If you have any questions, any doubts, any queries, any comments, any suggestions, please drop them in the comment section below. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do so immediately at the earliest because once you subscribe, you'll be able to get all the videos that I post on chemistry. I'm going to be doing lots more videos on a lot of different lessons. In fact, someone asked me to post a video on black body radiations, which I'm going to do the moment I complete the other two parts that are left in this particular lesson. And then I'm going to be doing a black body radiation video. And that's going to be really a very long one, probably an hour long. So if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please subscribe and you'll be able to get a notification the moment I post a video. You'll get a separate panel on the left side of your YouTube channel on your uh, homepage. You'll get a separate panel called subscriptions and you'll be able to see this particular channel uh, with the green logo as you can see on top right. And uh, you will be able to go to my channel without having to search on YouTube. In case you like the video, please also hit the like button. This is Kalyan Kumar signing off. Have a great day, goodbye and thank you for watching.